As usual, here's the chapter list. And uh, my reminder that this video is my own experience of using PLCs in my machines. Uh, I'm not a PLC expert. Inside all my arcade machines, there's a little grey box, a Mitsubishi grey box with red LEDs on it. These are the programmable logic controllers, the computers at the heart of the machines. Several people asked for an episode about them, so here it is. Their big advantage is that they're so robust, reliable and long-lasting. I've got over 50 of them that run every day, and quite a few of them have run for 20 years without any problem. I think in that time I've had about three fail, uh, but even then it's not a big problem because they're completely backward compatible, so you can just load the code into a brand new one uh, and it'll work just the same. Their main downside is cost. They're expensive. They're built for industrial automation, uh, so quality is more important than price. Later in the video I'll explain how I use second-hand ones and economise as much as I can. But they're never going to be as cheap as using a modern uh, microcontroller like an Arduino. In 1991 I got involved helping to build an ambitious theme park ride for a shopping mall in Sheffield. Right away, supper. Floating through an empty warehouse in North Wales. The sofas moved through a succession of 24 different scenes, all built by different people. You embarked in the living room, which was literally alive. All the furniture and everything was uh, moving about. You then went on to other rooms of the house, uh, increasingly bizarre and peculiar, uh, before venturing out into the world. Uh, and things got even more weird and wonderful. Anyway, to give the construction some sort of uniformity, it was decided that every scene was to be controlled by a Mitsubishi PLC. These are relatively new at the time, and none of us had ever used one before. Fortunately, the programs were relatively simple. We just had to trigger a series of timed outputs when each sofa entered the scene. In the instruction manual, I found some code which looked perfect for the job, but I just couldn't get it to run. I kept trying, but it was days before I found there was actually a misprint in the manual and the code was wrong. Sadly, uh, the shopping centre got cold feet about the ride and it was never installed in the end, though we did get paid for it. But in retrospect, the struggle with the PLC wasn't time wasted at all. I'd actually learnt a lot about coding it. My early arcade machines were also just a linear sequence of events of different motors coming on. So with the Chiropodis, the one motor first lowers her head, then it comes on in reverse and brings it back up. Uh, then the second motor twiddles her thumbs. <coughs> then back to the first motor to lower her head again. Now a bigger motor uh, that lowers her uh, under the counter and then a motor inside the foot compartment uh, that makes all the creepy crawly sensations on your foot. <laughs> 
And finally, of course, the big motor comes back on to bring her back up again. So it's just a linear sequence of uh, events and motors. And the way I used to control these was with these things called uh, cam timers or drum sequences. So uh, there's a little motor on the end here. And when you put your coin in uh, the machine, that just started rotating the drum. Uh, on top here there are all these cams, red and black cams, and you can see uh, this row of little rollers going up and down uh, on the back here, and they're each connected to a switch on the back here. So each one of these cams controls one of the motors. All the cams are adjustable, so it's easy to adjust the time that each one switches on and off. Here, if I just plug this in, um, They're all um, connected to different mechanisms on the bench. And I like these things because it, it's transparent. You can see exactly what's going on. And to start with, I was a bit resistant to the idea of PLCs because I thought, well, they're just sort of black boxes. Uh, but um, I was impressed by that one on the uh, theme park ride. And of course, they can do exactly the same thing as, as these cam timers. So I can literally just swap it over. Here's my uh, PLC. Um, Plug it in, connect the motors to the power, and they'll carry on doing roughly the same thing as they did before. Well, I was surprised that um, they weren't quite such black boxes as I'd feared. Like the cam timer, there's a sort of simplicity about the limited number of outputs which are either on or off. What was really useful are the little lights. <laughs> it sounds so trivial, but to be able to see what was going on I made a huge difference. And I very quickly got used to them. I suppose I just got hooked. Uh, but it's not surprising they're made like this. It's very important in factory automation to be able to find faults quickly. Uh, downtime costs a lot of money. And, and the whole way factory automation is designed is designed round fixing faults quickly. So it's not surprising PLCs are still used to this day uh, for um, warehouse conveyor systems, for production lines, and even for complex multi-axis CNC tools. To get started, I'd recommend buying a second-hand uh, PLC on eBay. Uh, automation engineers uh, often uh, upgrade uh, systems in factories and stuff, um, but they can't reuse the old ones, they have to fit new ones. Uh, and so uh, eBay is a rich resource now. Uh, and I, they're so well made that I've never had any trouble with any of the second-hand ones that I bought. Uh, I actually had one arrive from a car wash company that was full of water. Um, I dried it out been working perfectly ever since. Uh, another one full of tea leaves, uh, powdered tea. <laughs> I don't think Mitsubishi is better than any of the other makes, it's just that that was the one I got into for the ride of life all those years ago and uh, gradually it, it just sort of seemed simpler to stick with the same brand and uh, and then when they started appearing cheap on eBay second-hand, uh, there didn't seem any particular reason to change. Though, if you're starting from scratch now, it's worth looking at some of the more recent American uh, brands that are, um, are better value, uh, particularly the software. Uh, because the software for Mitsubishi is a bit of a problem, I think. Uh, I bought mine uh, for that commission in the 90s and I managed to get upgrades uh, until relatively recently. Uh, but if you start from scratch now, you could easily pay 1,300 quid for it new. Um, it's, I think it's worth 
ringing round a few automation companies to ask the price. Uh, there may be sort of student versions and that sort of thing. And if you do get them from a, a supplier like that, then you've got a helpline. And my experience of uh, my local automation company is that they um, their backup is good. You get talking to some people who obviously know their stuff. Uh, but there are cheaper alternatives. Uh, on eBay, occasionally American companies seem to offer the software for uh, £70 or so, but I don't quite know how that works. Uh, or then they're online, there are sites offering free downloads. Uh, so, uh, certainly, I don't feel I was tech savvy enough to try this one, um, particularly because they didn't even seem to be able to swell the word developer. Well, all BLCs have uh, the same sort of basic elements. So you've got the inputs up at the top, the outputs down at the bottom. Uh, and then here you've got the LEDs for the inputs and below them the LEDs for the outputs. Uh, two more, three more lights on that side, power, run and error. Um, the power goes in at the end here. This one is a for a 24 volt and uh, there's a stabilized 24 volt output from all PLCs usually an amp or two enough to power any sensors and also relays on the output side which I find useful. The other two mysterious uh, terminals are called SS. I'll try to explain them later in this video in the input output chapter. Then what else? That beneath this cover um, there's the connector. This is the old style connector. The new ones are just USB. Um, then there's a little grey switch on the side uh, that's run and stop. And uh, then this little thing in here, that's a potentiometer um, that's addressable in the software so you can adjust a particular timer or something without having to connect the PLC to a laptop or anything. So that's the sort of basic idea. Um, inside, uh, this is a rare one that did die. <laughs> um, uh, the processor is on the top level. Um, this case has a very large uh, capacitor, which I think is something to do with storage because um, bigger PLCs do have a lithium battery in to provide long-term storage. Uh, below there is the uh, board with all the relays, the output relays, the black boxes there uh, and other stuff. And uh, some PLCs have a third uh, layer which is the mains uh, power supply reducing it to uh, 24 volts. So that's the sort of uh, basic insides. It's called step ladder programming because uh, it's sort of almost graphical the way it's programmed, uh, like a ladder with different rungs. And each rung, there's an input on the left side and an output on the right side. Uh, but these inputs and outputs, they're not just the physical inputs and outputs on the surface of the PLC, uh, they're more often their internal relays, counters, timers, and all sorts of other functions. Uh, and then you can have extra logic gates and things uh, in the middle of each rung. And the program runs through these rungs uh, to the bottom of the ladder and then starts all over again, uh, hundreds of times a second. Uh, so I'll start with a simple program. Um, load x naught uh, and out uh, t naught uh, k30. Um, this will start the timer when X0 comes on. Uh, K is a duration, uh, so um, it measured in 0.1 second intervals, so 30 is 3 seconds. So, and now if I add a second rung, uh, load T0 and out, out Y0, uh, this will switch Y0 on when T0 comes on after 3 seconds. So these two rungs of the ladder have just created a simple delay uh, between switching X0 on and the output Y0 coming on. 
the software has a useful monitoring function so you can actually watch uh, it happening. To make the light flash uh, I can add a second timer uh, load x0 out t1 uh, k10 uh, I think I'll make the first timer a bit shorter I'll get, make that half a second um, now I've got to add something to make uh, the timers reset when they get to one second so that they start the thing all over again. And to do that I add an AND NOT T1 in here and in there. So now what happens is that when T1 switches on, uh, the first time the ladder comes round again it gets to that rung T1 will be on and that breaks the connection to T0 and to T1. Uh, and so the next time, the time after, when it comes round, uh, T0 will be back to zero, uh, starting all over again. <laughs> uh, don't worry if you don't fully understand this, it does take a bit of uh, getting used to. Okay, so uh, you've written the program, the next thing is to transfer it to the PLC. First you have to convert it for some reason, it doesn't like ladder logic directly. Then you go to online and write. Uh, oh, before we do that, um, we have to turn uh, the PLC off and plug the connecting cable in. USB at this end and some it's got sort of proprietary cable for, uh, and connector for these um, earlier PLCs, not a standard USB. Um, OK, that's plugged in, so you go on to online and write program and uh, uh, select all, execute, execute and uh, off it will go. OK, then undo the cable, switch to run uh, and now in theory when I um, switch X not on, you'll see that light come on and after a bit the lights will start flashing and you can also see Y not light come on on the PLC itself <clears throat> so now with the monitor function um, we should be able to see it uh, running It continually counts up to one second and then starts all over again. Well, I'm clumsy at this because uh, I actually now uh, program in a, in a way that I find quicker and uh, more intuitive. With the idea of the ladder in the background, I use this thing called an instruction list. Load X naught. Then out to T0, K5, that's half a second. Out T1, uh, K10, one second. Oh, I forgot. Yes, it should have been and not uh, T1. Um, then uh, load T0 uh, and finally out Y0. You can see I'm more used to programming that way. Um, well, I'm not going to go into more detail about the actual programming. Uh, I think that I'm just so used to it. I take so much for granted. Uh, I wouldn't really be a good teacher. Uh, but also, uh, a better way of learning the programming, I think, is with online PLC simulators. There are quite a few of them around, and they're fun to use. And you know, you don't have to buy anything to, to play with the software. <laughs> um, so it's, it's a good way to see if you like it before showing out for all the physical stuff. Here I'm copying the stepladder program I wrote where a timer delays the output switching on. It's nice the way it shows the progress of the timer. One thing that those PLC simulators don't particularly include is uh, writing uh, comments. I had this problem with the donation box I made for St Thomas's 
1995. I really struggle to understand what I did now, though at the time I felt it was so blindingly obvious I didn't need to write any comments. Uh, if you don't, when you go back to a bit of code ten years later, uh, it's very hard to remember exactly what's going on. Any computer course you do, they always tell you that uh, uh, there should be as many comments as there are lines of code, and I completely agree. Uh, the other aspect of this is I think I was trying to keep the code as elegant and short as possible at the time, uh, whereas now um, I repeat bits and do anything to make it as easy to read as you can. Uh, that's more important than <laughs> the length, for, at least for my machines. <laughs> well, choosing what PLC to buy. Um, well, the very simplest, the bottom of the range, are things called intelligent relays. Uh, and they're great if you don't want to do, if it's a very simple program, because you can program them actually on the relay itself. You don't need to buy the cable and the software. But if the program gets complicated, uh, really an ordinary PLC is a lot better, much more suitable for my arcade machines anyway. So I start with the basic PLC range. And probably the simplest uh, one to buy now is the FX3S series. Um, just because you can use an ordinary uh, USB lead to connect it. Um, but I have a lot of older ones um, that work just as well for the sort of things that I use. Um, the only trouble is that you do need to buy a sort of dedicated uh, connector. Um, you can get these cheap. You can get these cheap ones from China, um, or you can buy uh, Mitsubishi's own lead, which I think does work a little bit better. Uh, but again, expensive. I think that's 180 quid or something. Uh, but I quite like these older ones. It extends uh, what's what you can go shopping for. Um, and the speed doesn't really seem to affect uh, the machines much. Um, yeah, the old ones can be ten times slower in their cycle speed than the recent ones. Uh, but because the software has um, high speed functions built into it, sort of interrupts to the progress, processing the ladder, um, you can do things like pulse catch and high speed counters and that sort of thing. So really, uh, for most things, uh, the speed uh, doesn't make much difference if you're doing basic uh, programming with them. You basically pay for the number of outputs, so uh, the cheapest ones only have two <laughs> outputs. Um, and then actually in this uh, budget series the maximum number of outputs uh, you can have is uh, 14. Uh, and there's no way of connecting an extension block or anything to it, so um, that's what you're stuck with. Uh, I should have said that, of course, the other thing that's changed with time is that they've got smaller. So uh, the, these are two not that many years apart um, that have the same number of outputs, but uh, uh, they have shrunk. <laughs> and I think the current ones are a bit sure more than that again. One unfortunate phase of their history Mitsubishi introduced these ones, uh, FX1, that was FX1N, and that one's FX1S, uh, where the LEDs were so dim you can't really see them, uh, and they're a menace, so I avoid those like the plague now. Uh, then for each model, um, you can get ones that are 24 volts DC power supply, uh, or equally you can get ones that uh, are mains in. Um, then you can get ones, the normal ones, just the relay outputs, uh, but you can also get ones with uh, transistor outputs. And of course that's very useful for things that have to switch on and off very frequently, or just for millions and millions of times. Uh, this is something I take into consideration when choosing which one. I think the transistor outputs take uh, about half, can take half an amp. The relays are rated at uh, two amps. Actually, the ones that I use, I like best from my arcade machines uh, are, are bigger things. Um, 
more output is always useful. Um, the FX2 range uh, has a, you could, a little cover that you can take off and, and put a connector in uh, to uh, add on extension blocks so you can have as many outputs as you like really. Um, yeah, I like those. Uh, the input and output voltages. Well, outputs are actually very straightforward because they're completely isolated from the PLC. So uh, the COM terminals, uh, that's COM2 for instance, is uh, joined to Y6, 7, 10 and 11 uh, by the re internal relays in the PLC. So you can put use it whatever voltage you like and with the different COM terminals you can have a variety of different ones. So that's straightforward. The inputs are slightly more complicated. Uh, the PLC is a 24 volt device so the first problem is if you're trying to use it with a 12 volt uh, sensor like uh, for a microcontroller um, or actually some of my coin acceptors are 12 volt. Well, you either have to use uh, a, a read or a signal relay uh, to convert it, uh, or in theory you can common the twelve, the, the zero volts. Uh, so, although in theory it's a good idea, in practice uh, it can be quite uh, challenging. Uh, I tried it on this machine on pirate practice, and uh, <laughs> I was running a right old muscle. I spent two weeks fiddling around with the wiring. I was getting weird voltage readings off things and I don't really understand why. Um, so ever since then, I've kept all the different power supplies isolated from each other. Uh, and I think that does help uh, make fault finding a bit easier and more straightforward. The other problem is when you have a mix of PNP and NPN uh, transistor output sensors, even if they're 24 volt. So here, um, this is a slotted opto sensor uh, that will switch when I um, block the, the slot. Uh, and that is an NPN sensor. And you can see at the moment it doesn't make any of the input lights turn up. Then here, I've got a little inductive sensor which is a PNP, the other sort, and equally that doesn't make any of the input lights turn up. So now I take the mysterious sync source wire and I connect it to the negative and now that one still doesn't work but now this one makes X2 light up. And the opposite, if I put sync source to plus 24 that one will work, and now um, the PNP one won't work. So what do you do if you've got a mixture of both? And it sometimes happens in my machines. Uh, well, it's not the end of the world. If it's just one or one or two, um, you can buy uh, a converter. Uh, these things just plug into the DIN rail. Um, they do cost 20 quid or so, but um, that's the quickest solution. Uh, but equally, if I've got more, more, I'll sometimes uh, make my own. Um, so here, uh, that's the, the sensor there. Um, the output comes to the base of a transistor, and then it's just a, a couple of resistors, one on the base and one on the collector. Uh, so it's not really such a, an awful problem. Uh, but you do have to remember <laughs> where they don't work. So I've mentioned once or twice um, the speed of uh, PLCs and how they've got faster. Uh, but I don't really have much of a feel for it. So I read that this one, this is uh, FX3G, uh, can process a simple instruction in 0.2 of a microsecond. Uh, but to see what this means, um, I tried a, an experiment. I bought a, a shaft encoder, uh, this has 400 steps per revolution, and hooked it up to a high speed counter on this PLC. So the idea of uh, the two lights, they're the output from the counter, it's a special counter called an AB counter. So it's counting uh, the two, the red and the green, alternately. 
And the point of an AB counter is that it can count up when the arrow is going this way and will count down uh, when the arrow is going uh, the other way. Uh, so it should be ca keeping track of its position. And at the moment I've programmed it so that it uh, switches uh, the main output of the counter on uh, at the top here. So anything over that uh, the light will be on and anything under it it will be off. With the monitoring function you can actually watch it counting up and down. So if I spin it round with my hand a few times um, I think that won't have confused it at all. It'll still switch yeah, at the top. Uh, at first I thought that might be enough. Um, but it obviously needs something faster. So uh, I c connect my electric drill to the shaft. Now. Uh, Okay, go back in reverse. Okay, so we're somewhere close now. Okay, so now if I undo the drill, pull off. This side, wouldn't it? Yes. <laughs> it's still spot on, and that's quite remarkable, really, because as this is whizzing round, each time it goes round, it's got to count 400. Uh, so <laughs> that's a lot of counts. Um, yeah, this says it goes round at 1500 RPM, so you can work it out if you want to. Uh, uh, so that gives me. Uh, an idea of the speed and it's certainly enough for anything that I would need in any of my arcade machines. Uh, but for full motion control you might want something even faster. And so that's why uh, you can buy special motion control extension blocks to go on PLCs uh, and then they can cope with anything. <laughs> Well, motion control is quite a fancy extension block for a PLC, uh, but there are a lot of other ones. Um, I struggled once with a, a real-time clock extension. Um, I think it was an internal thing, actually, uh, which I could never get to work reliably. Uh, I wasn't very accurate either. And then I had another struggle with a, a serial COM port one. Um, which I couldn't get to work at all. Uh, so I rather avoid these extension blocks, apart from um, extension extra outputs. And they're, they're just brilliant. Um, so it's often the cheapest way uh, to um, get extra outputs. And very often I underestimate the number of outputs I'm going to need on a machine. And so at the last minute to be able to slap one of these on the end is uh, extremely useful. This one has eight extra outputs. Uh, and even better, these are the, my favourite ones, these have 16. And so you just remove the cap at the end and uh, it plugs in down there. Uh, this is an FX2. Um, the basic range, the FXS, doesn't have the connector for extension blocks. So if you buy an FX3S, uh, it's no good. Um, but the one I was just using uh, for the uh, speed test, um, that's a, a 3G. And so that does have the extension uh, socket in here. Well, besides um, all the physical extension blocks, the software also includes a large number of what are called applied instructions um, to do all sorts of fancy things. Uh, these, like the extension blocks, quickly get uh, pretty complicated and uh, I don't use many of them. Uh, I, 
The only one I use regularly really is compare. I do find that useful. You can see that it actually falls open on this page. Um, to compare two different counters or to compare a counter with a timer or a fixed uh, number or something. Uh, I've got used to that one. Once you get used to them then uh, it's okay. But if you use one that you don't use regularly then it makes it hard reading the program because uh, you've forgotten exactly how it works and what it does. Uh, there's also one that's only mentioned almost in passing that's called Pulse Catch which is very useful uh, and that's if you have a a sensor that only comes on very fleetingly. Um, it's a sort of interrupt that will catch a, a brief um, a brief pulse. So yeah I try to avoid the applied instructions as much as I can. But there's one other thing in the uh, PLC software that is completely brilliant uh, and that is the idea of states. Um, these are just parts of the program that are active uh, at any one time but if the state is off then uh, it, it just ignores it as it runs through the rungs of the ladder. And uh, I didn't need it for the early machines but Mobility Masterclass and all the games I've made since then is essential because uh, with a game different things happen and the program has to branch so uh, one state can trigger two different states next according to, to what happens. Our safety training presentation. First choose the age you are training for. Beginners should start at 80. You are now fully trained. Try a practice run. Try to do better crossing the next lane. So in Mobility Masterclass, uh, where are we? That is the first state, S1. Uh, that is the instruction state. Uh, and that's just going to be a fixed length while you, you uh, are told what to do. Um, so then you get to S2. And uh, that's when you actually start to cross the motorway. That uh, starts the camera moving when you pull up the Zimmer frame handles. And of course that can go either way. Uh, you can get successfully to the other end of that lane or you can have a crash en route. So uh, within here, um, that is getting successfully to the end of the lane. So if, you're, if you then move on to S4. Um, but if you uh, have a crash, there's a sensor in the camera that detects if you bump into something. Um, that sets S3. Uh, and S3 will switch the camera off and switch to the pre-recorded video of the animation. And at the end of that, it'll reverse the car just to get the camera uh, back on track, ready to cross the next lane. And then it continues in this fashion for all four lanes and then it has to come back to the beginning and then cross a second time for your examination. So in all there are 25 different states in this game. Well, it took me a while to get the hang of states. <laughs> it's not totally straightforward. Uh, but uh, I do encourage you, it's well worth the struggle. 
because um, once things start to get complicated, I mean, there's sort of 2,000 lines of code in this uh, program. When you're writing it, uh, it, it's much easier because you're only concentrating on one little section at a time and you can get that right before going on to the next one. And equally, when something goes wrong and you're trying to track a fault, um, you can, by inspecting the code, you can see which state it's got uh, hung up in. Uh, and that's very often the best clue as to what's actually gone wrong. In the fulfillment centre, I wanted the speed that the man runs around the warehouse to be proportional to how fast you're walking. Uh, so, uh, it's actually a stepper motor that powers the chain around the track. Um, to, but to work out the speed, uh, there's a, actually, uh, all there is, it's just an ordinary slotted opto sensor down the bottom, and there's a sort of comb attached to the foot plates uh, that runs through this uh, slot, um, sending pulses to an Arduino. And the Arduino uh, then uh, translates this into pulses that it sends to the stepper motor driver. So all the PLC has to do is when the machine gets to the right state, it just switches the Arduino on and then uh, the chain will start to move in proportion to the speed of the foot plates. Actually, I now realise from doing that experiment with the speed of recent PLCs, uh, I could have done it all inside the PLC. Uh, but I quite like having these separate uh, chunks. I think, it, as I said before, it makes finding faults easier. And particularly in this one, I had quite a lot of trouble with the foot uh, plates and the walking mechanism. They just get such intensive use. Uh, I had problems with vibration and contacts and things coming un loose. And it was just... Uh, it made things easier, I think. Hello, this is Captain Hunkin speaking. We're currently cruising at 37,000 feet. The weather in Costa Valente is sunny and very warm at 98 degrees centigrade. We have a strong tailwind today, so we expect to be landing in just a few seconds. Thank you for choosing Micro Break. You will now be transferring to a coach to take you to your final destination. Micro Break was my first machine to incorporate video. Originally, it ran on a CD player at about 350 by 290 pixels, uh, the video for CD format. One PLC output went to the play button and the second one went to the next track button. Despite the clunkiness and low resolution, it was wonderfully immersive and I was completely hooked. Once the ride's running, the PLC doesn't talk to the CD player at all, but they keep perfectly in sync without any communication. It's magic, but makes life so much simpler. Well, with my recent machines, uh, I've got a lot more ambitious with using video. So for instance, on Celeb, uh, there are two separate screens, so I need two separate video streams. And the one down here switches to uh, the drone's live view of um, the Hollywood mansion. So uh, <laughs> there's quite a lot going on inside there. Uh, and uh, the actual players around the back of this screen 
Um, and, and they look a right old mess, but uh, what they are, you know, these purple boxes called uh, Bright Sign players. And uh, Bright Sign, it's, it's uh, sort of, they're solidly made, a bit like PLCs. Uh, they're used uh, by museums and uh, advertising displays, that sort of thing. Um, so they are, they're expensive, but they are reliable. Uh, so normally they're programmed with uh, Bright Sign's own uh, Bright Author package that's free. Uh, but I didn't get on with that very well. And uh, one day I was talking to my supplier and telling him what I ideally would like. And he said, oh, my mate could uh, program a script for that, uh, which he did. And uh, how it works is that alongside the video tracks, you also put this uh, programming file, the script, uh, as another file um, on the card. And uh, that tells the player what to do. So. In my case, what happens now, I can take up to eight outputs from a PLC and this will convert them, uh, read it as binary numbers, so it spits out into the bright sign player uh, the right number to play up to 256 different tracks. I've never used that many, um, but it's nice to have that sort of potential. And the switching is very, very fast too, so uh, that's also... You can see how quickly the right sign players switch when you find one of the celebrities. The picture on the, this monitor changes from the drone's view to the, to the animation. What'll it be, madam? The usual? Well, hello. Uh, I was really delighted when I first got it to work, cutting on the zoom like that. <laughs> uh, it was very satisfying. When I first viewed the rough cut of this video, it did make me feel rather old school. Uh, years ago I did start to learn to program Arduinos, uh, C++. Um, but then uh, Bruce Shapiro, a bit of a hero of mine, um, said, Unless there's something you really need to do uh, that your program can't do, it's best to stick with just one that you're really familiar with than to try and learn lots of new ones. Well, I took his advice and uh, here I am. Uh, years later I wrote to thank him and uh, he replied, if only I had followed the advice that I gave you. <laughs> so here I am, surrounded by PLCs anyway. Uh, and looking back, uh, I think it was very fortunate uh, getting involved with that project for the Ride of Life all those years ago and uh, having to use one. Uh, because as uh, the machines and the arcades have expanded, uh, they've become more like uh, bits of industrial automation could be used hundreds of thousands of times. Because a lot of industrial automation projects are, are one-offs. Um, bespoke projects and uh, so the machines are virtually their machines are virtually prototypes uh, and need tweaking and adjustments to get them running smoothly just like my arcade machines and I think despite the sophistication of uh, modern PLCs uh, at heart there is something simple about them a lot simpler than a, an ordinary computer uh, there are no updates, there's no fussy start-up or shut-down routines, and you don't have to connect them to the internet. Um, I think perhaps it's just this basic simplicity uh, is why people still use them so widely, and I don't think they're in any danger of becoming extinct.